All right, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you're joining from. Uh, today we're gonna to be covering EDR slash MDR and how it can protect your organization. Uh, for any of those who haven't been here, um, Dr. Jerry Craig, uh, for those of you who've been joining, appreciate you continuing to join and support this effort. Today we're gonna to cover a few topics. It's a fewer number of slides, but there's some extra content on there and some things that we wanna talk about. Um, we're going to cover EDR and MDR and kind of the terminology and, and what people are calling these, these services, as well as some of the technologies and product and service overviews. We'll get a little bit into the advanced protection aspect of it and what's available to you as a consumer of these products. The role of the SOC itself, the Security Operations Center, and why you might need one of these versus going without a SOC some key takeaways, and then as usual, uh, just leaving open some time for questions and answers. So I think to start off, uh, terminology is always a good thing. Get everybody on the same page, depending on you know your current level of knowledge, uh, where, where you've worked, who you've spoken to, vendors you might've interacted with. So I'm gonna lay out a few here. The, the overall conversation is about EDR and MDR, but I threw some extras in here and you'll see why they're important in a second. So EDR stands for Endpoint Detection and Response. At a basic level, this is the software that's installed on endpoints via an agent. It's there to protect the host, collect data, communicate typically with a portal. Um, it can be very simple, it can just be antivirus or it can be much more. Uh, so the EDR term is being used for anything that's kind of being placed on that endpoint agent, regardless of the functionality and how much or how little functionality it actually delivers. When you get to MDR, uh, manage detection and response, this is typically the service portion of it. So if you have just a product, you're buying EDR. If you're having a service, it's MDR, and the service could include the product as well as like a bundled option. Uh, but at this point, it's normally a security operations center. This means live humans that are helping you in addition to AI and some machine learning. Um, it can be fully automated. Uh, which removes some of the need for the SOC, but when you do automate the portions that are available to you and remove the SOC, you then limit functionality, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, beyond that, companies wanted to start differentiating themselves. So if I've got 50 vendors that are out offering EDR and 25 that offer the MDR service, well, why don't I create XDR and I'll add extra functionality, extra tools, um, maybe combine MDR and EDR in a whole new platform, and you get what's now called extended detection and response. This is a collection of EDR and network traffic. So now we're going beyond where I can put an agent on a host, like a server or workstation, collecting network data, and I'm getting a more holistic view of my environment. Um, a lot of organizations in the industry itself will refer to this as a SIM SOC solution, which is a system event uh, information and event management or SIM tool. And then the SOC added onto it, or as I wrote there, SIM slash SOC. That's probably the most common terminology you'll hear. XDR, if you're gonna hear it, is most likely something that the company or vendor is branding themselves um, to essentially make up this exact same service offering. Um, you can go a step further and include what's called a source, uh, security orchestration automation and response. And this is really in the background. This is the automation and remediation piece. So if I'm a SOC and I'm running basic tasks day to day, I wanna automate those, I'll add a SOAR. So you can start with EDR, which is the product itself, and then you can add MDR. And by adding that MDR, you might have XDR, you might have the SIM SOC, you might have a SOAR. Um, you may not know what you have. You may be provided a service that you're paying for. And on the back end, these things are essentially invisible to you or transparent to the service you're getting, but they may be operating. Uh, and unless you ask the vendor, you won't know, um, assuming they'll answer and tell you what they have, you won't know what they have in the background and how much of this functionality. And remember, I put a note down there, um, each vendor can name this anything they want. So you have to be careful about what you're getting. Uh, if you go out to a website, you see a marketing slick, you get an email and someone says, I've got the greatest XDR platform out there. That really should not tell you anything. You'd have to go and investigate. Well, tell me specifically what you're offering. What are these services? How are they being offered? And then you can kind of repackage that into the acronyms that I've placed on the screen and determine uh, how good are they from an apples to apples comparison to someone else. 
So let's talk about what they actually include, though, from a common you know, standard feature perspective. So we're calling these you know, technologies, products, services, platform. All these words are kind of being used interchangeably here just for the sake of this is something that's being delivered to you that you're paying for. Uh, from an EDR perspective, it's common that all of them are going to have some form of antivirus protection, um, what level of protection they have, the way it works, the engines that they use, all of those things. Those are differentiators between vendors and the price that you pay in most cases, but at a basic level, they include antivirus. Uh, you will get some host data collection and analysis. Part of these tools is to collect that data so that someone can review it. Whether or not it's being reviewed by anyone or by the tool is a completely different situation, but it is set up to do that. And then automated remediation, there's an asterisk there and the asterisk is the same throughout the slide, which is this is one of those weird kind of buckets that we use terminology, but it means something completely different potentially to each vendor and again, each level of service. So automated remediation at the EDR level could be as simple as I've got uh, antivirus and if it matches a signature, the antivirus automatically quarantines a piece of malware, maybe it deletes the malware, et cetera. So it's automatically being done by the product itself, no human interaction. And now the vendor can say it's automated remediation. Um, others might say to themselves, well, I expect you to go roll something back. I expect you to um, see an alert somewhere in the system and then triage it through another system, which is another form of automated remediation. So you cannot just see these types of words and assume that everyone's providing you the same thing. That's, that's really the main point I'm trying to make here. Uh, when you move to MDR, you're looking at continuous monitoring. Again, this one's a big one you have to pay attention to because depending on the size of the organization that's that's acting in that vendor role, they might be 24 by seven by 365. They might be Monday to Friday, you know, eight to eight, normal business hours, whatever the case may be. And you have to define what continuous monitoring means. Um, there's a difference between actively going out and looking for things and just responding to an alert. So some questions that'll have to be asked there before you try to do a comparison of more than one vendor. Um, you do typically, though, get live human interactions for investigations and triage. So look at it as like the EDR product, for example, is doing the first line of defense. It's trying to block or remediate malware as it comes in. If it can't or if something else is happening on the network and the tools are able to alert the human, now you have a human being in there that can actually do these investigations, perform triage and potentially remediate. Um, there's a term managed remediation that's often included by a lot of vendors. I like to point this one out because the level of remediation is going to be dependent upon the level of access the vendor has to your environment. So look at your, your current environment. And if your vendor is only able to see traffic or logs that you've pumped out to that vendor's tool, and let's call it a SIM at that point, and they can't do anything but monitor the, the logs that are coming to them and then alert off of them, they can't actually go back in and remediate. They've got to have a way to do that. Um, usually it's the, the tools that are providing the logs that have the remediation involved. If you allow them to then manage those tools from a portal or a console, then they have the ability to remediate. So one of the big questions that really needs to be asked when you see manage remediation there is to what extent can you remediate? Give me examples um, and then use multiple examples. So if the vendor provides, well, here's what I can do on a host, uh, like a server or a workstation. Okay, great but that might be because they're managing EDR. What happens when it's on a printer, it's on uh, a network appliance or a firewall or something along those lines? If they don't have access to that, they're gonna say, well, my, my ability to remediate ends at the host. That's normally not something they'll tell you unless you ask, so I, I highly recommend um, putting a set of questions like that together and asking in advance. When you get to XDR, again, because this is a kind of custom acronym that a lot of folks are using in the industry now, this can vary widely. I tried to put the most common items on here, but you'll notice two out of three have an asterisk. So typically this is environment wide. This is where you're talking about well beyond just agents and endpoints. You're talking about data collection at the network level, pretty much anything it can see, it, it can collect and then report and alert on. Um, it has the ability at that point to then tie indicators of compromise together. So one of the ways I look at this is it's it's like saying five different things are occurring over a two day period in your environment. Any one of those five by themselves, if the tools were to trigger an alert would look benign and you might have no reason to think that you're being attacked or hacked. 
when you put all five together over a certain time frame, all of a sudden it paints this picture of, well, these are the behaviors of an attacker, someone's on my network. It's at this level that you're starting to get that visibility or true visibility because these systems have some of that built in. They have a way to parse that data, put it together, give the human analyst um, a view of the environment that they wouldn't normally have. You can do it at some of the lower levels, but it's much more difficult because the platforms typically will not give you the same type of dashboards and GUI that you're used to. And everything's gonna be a manual process. So if you're not manually combing through lots of logs and lots of tools, you're likely to miss it. Um, so this is kind of like an automated way to some extent of cutting down the amount of investigation and correlation you have to do. One of the nice things about this though, is it really works across a lot of different platforms. Now, one of the problems with working across different platforms is that your tool set has to be able to ingest and understand that log data. So depending on how much money you spend, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, you may be limited in how much you can ingest as well as how much you can understand. Um, and from a logging perspective, one of the most important things to think about is that most of these tools are sophisticated enough that they can take in any type of log. What a lot of them can't do or can't do well is look at the different logs from different vendors and say, I understand the formatting of your log. Therefore, when you wanna search something, query something, I'm gonna return the results in a particular manner. They tend to just lump everything into a big bucket and then the human has to be able to go in and say, here's how it's formatted. Here's what I actually want when I do a query. And if you don't have someone doing all of that custom type work in the background, the logs aren't useless, but they're, they're far less useful uh, because of that manual inter intervention. Typically, the more you pay and the bigger the, the vendor, the more research and development time they have into all of the top vendors so that if you're using kind of the industry best, you know, higher quality, upper right quadrant and Gardner's charts type vendors, they're already going to have built that, that kind of functionality in because they're working with them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, they can also do threat analysis and prioritization. Prioritization is probably one of the areas that's most important here because, again, if, even as the human side of it, and I've seen it when I uh, managed a SOC, you can be just bombarded and overwhelmed with the number of alerts and triggers. And the majority of them are going to be benign. They're going to be expected behavior. Um, what makes it so much alerting and triggering and so difficult is that the SOC doesn't normally have intimate, intimate knowledge of your environment and your company. So what would look like normal behavior to them is going to be very, to you, excuse me, is going to be very difficult for them to figure out. So they have to do extra work to say, is this common? They'll rule most of that out. Most of it will be a false positive. Most of them will be attempts that were made that were unsuccessful. But nonetheless, it's a lot of data they have to comb through. So these tools do a fairly good job of assigning like a risk value or score to it. And, and each one has their own kind of proprietary method. But once those scores are applied, the SOC analyst can look at it and go, let's start with the highest risk and work down. And then finally, the SOAR. This was the, the platform I was talking about that can automate. So let's say, for example, that every day uh, a bunch of people try to attack and compromise your accounts through brute force, but they're unsuccessful. It's going to trigger a lot of low-level alarms. Uh, you can suppress them for the most part until they reach a certain threshold. But what the SOAR will allow you to do is to go in there and say, okay, if it meets a certain set of criteria, same criteria that a human analyst would look at and come to a decision on, I can program the SOAR to, to come to that same conclusion and then take action. And that might just be close the ticket out, say it was a false positive, et cetera. Uh, so this allows a lot of automation via playbooks. And the playbooks are nice because the SOC can then take all sorts of different products and say, step one, do this, step two, do that. You can work through all of your tools. You can then branch off and say, if I get to step five in this workflow, the tools have done you know, the most that they can. I need human interaction, vice versa. Uh, you know, Once the human interacts and maybe the human interacts on step one to validate something, then it can go back into its workflow and, and start working with tools again. So a lot of benefits there, but I will touch later on, on some of the downfalls because um, out of the gate, the source sounds like a lifesaver. Uh, and in many cases, it's, it's a very difficult tool to implement. Some advanced protection options. I won't go into detail what each of these are, but I wanted to throw them up here because some vendors are going to include these automatically. Some will not, some will charge you extra. So you have to be careful that when you're looking at different vendor 
platforms and they say we can do X, Y, and Z, can do and will provide at a certain cost are two completely different things. Uh, there are some vendors where, you know, let's say two or three of these items are bundled into the basic package that they offer. Then there are others that are add-on um, features that will get turned on if you pay more. Others are completely different agents and products. It's just that as a vendor, uh, through the size typically that they've grown to through acquisitions, they've acquired companies that do all of these different things, but they haven't put them into a single agent. So if you sign up for five things, you may have to deploy two or three different agents all under that, that vendor's name. Now, there are some vendors who treat it differently, and every time they acquire someone or they add functionality, it becomes an additional module within the same agent. So when you first deploy the agent, you'll see that there's 10 modules, nine of them are grayed out, uh, but you see that they exist and they're options. And then the one that you pay for is there. And if you say, I need this other one, all of a sudden you increase your license and that module goes from being grayed out to being something that you can, you can touch. Uh, so very much dependent on the vendor. You cannot assume regardless of acronym that you're gonna get one or more, or all of these, you, you really need to ask. And if there's certain ones in particular that are of more importance to you, my recommendation is, you know, if you're if you're working with an MSP like Antiva, reach out to your account manager to get information on specific ones and whether or not it'd be a benefit. If you're doing this on your own, do a little Google research, maybe pay someone for some consulting hours, but really try to understand based on your unique environment, which ones are the most applicable. If cost isn't an issue or you have a vendor that's supplying everything for one bundled price, then by all means, the more security, the better. Uh, but that's typically not the case. And then if you have anything from like a compliance perspective, like you need to, you need to control USB devices, those are things you want to ask. Can I control them? To what level? Um, different tools have different levels of granularity. So it helps you and behooves you to come to that, that table for that conversation to say, here's what I need to do to be compliant. Can your tool achieve this? And then there's some cross-platform feature sets, and this is kind of a, a term I made up here, but really what it means is that it's interacting with other, other items. So if I wanna interact with a firewall, my SIM might be able to do that, my EDR might be able to do that, but you really have to look at whether or not they can connect and integrate to those tools. Do they have their own type of functionality built in? Um, some EDRs, for example, will have a built-in firewall option, but that firewall is really for that host, not for the entire organization. So you want to be careful if you're just starting out and someone says, I'm selling you this and it comes with a firewall. From a terminology perspective, you might be saying, great, I, I now have a firewall, but you don't have a firewall in the traditional sense and you would still need to go buy that. So just be careful there. A lot of good features here, though, a lot of things that you can add uh, from a protection standpoint, from a visibility and reporting standpoint. But each one comes typically with a cost as well as a level of administration and kind of user knowledge. Um, both if you're administering it and if you're getting reports from a SOC and you're wanting to digest and understand what is this data really telling me. I think that's one area that folks often overlook is that you can get these pretty reports um, and there's a lot of widgets and dashboards and graphs and charts that, that make them you know, somewhat ready for copy paste into an executive summary, but you have to be able to speak to and understand what each of those means, where it's falling short, where it's doing a good job to protect you uh, and et cetera. And then probably the most important here uh, before the key takeaways would be the role of the SOC. So I tried to kind of make this going from left to right being the you know, least managed, least expensive kind of to the most expensive. Um, but at, a, at, at the bottom end of it, you'd really call this kind of an unmanaged solution. This is your basic antivirus. It can have more, you know, one or more of the features I talked about previously. I threw the name of Vast up there. I'm only giving you company names just to show you some form of reference. This is not in any way to mean that one is you know, better or worse than the other, but I, I just want to at least give you something to associate with. So from an Avast perspective, uh, you know, if you have a personal machine, you can go online, you can download a free version, or you can pay for it. If you have the free version, it's protecting that host. And really, you have a little bit of configuration you can do to that host, and that's it. It doesn't require a human. It's going to do basic functionality. Um, it's the easiest to manage because there's not a lot to manage but then you're gonna be limited obviously in its capabilities in the, the granular configuration. You can then move up to what I call a partially managed solution. This is more of an advanced EDR. It, it reports to a central console. Uh, so you can buy a set of licenses. Let's say you're a company with 50 employees. 
You can buy 50 licenses. You can deploy those licenses from that console. You can set up scans. You can uh, manage your licensing, manage your renewals, manage policy, et cetera. It can still be done internal though. And typically at this level, it is done internally because you're paying either for a dedicated IT person to manage this where once they buy it, set it up, deploy it, and get everything going, there's very little that they have to do to it. The, the product will block as much malware as it can automatically. It can be set up to update itself on a regular cadence. It can be set up to run scans and provide reports, et cetera. So you're kind of in that good middle ground where you're getting good features, easy to manage. You don't necessarily have to hire someone or outsource it, but again, you're gonna be limited to some of the features and the human aspect that you get when you get to the fully managed side. Which brings us to the fully managed or what I'm calling the SOC solution. Here's where you're getting everything potentially or anything that we talked about. You can bundle everything from the EDR to the MDR, add on XDR type services, add a SIM, SOAR, et cetera. The biggest advantage here beyond the functionality and the tool set that you're getting is you're getting live human beings to help. Uh, I know there's a lot of folks, especially when cost is a big concern, especially when you're a small startup and you're trying to grow, you're, you're trying to limit costs as much as possible. You don't want to invest in the internal uh, personnel to manage these tools. You want to go with as, mo as much self-service, self-managed type tools as you can. And those work to some extent. And a lot of times they work fine for most people's application right up until you have an attack or it alerts you on something and you don't know how to respond. When that happens, really, it's a time-sensitive issue, and you have nowhere to turn to unless you have a SOC. Um, if you get hacked, uh, if someone attacks you and is successful, having that lower-level product without the SOC won't do you a lot of good at that point because the success, the, the attack was already successful, and you have no way to reach out to someone. And even if you do find someone, they're going to say, most likely, well, I've got to come in and deploy my tools. I've got to start capturing logs. And anything that happened prior to us coming in we may not be able to support. So in a lot of cases, when this happens, and I see a lot of clients reach out and say, okay, give me those better packages. What we're really having to say is no problem, but understand this is really protecting you from here and on into the future. Retroactively, it's not doing a lot. There are some exceptions and depending on how you retain logs and everything, you may be able to do a little bit of retro investigation, uh, maybe 30 days, something like that. Uh, but it's not going to be the same thing as having these, these solutions deployed in advance. And I put over there what the, the SOC's main roles are. I could probably add 20 more items to this, but at a high level, they're there to provide you 24 by 7 by 365 support. Again, not everyone provides that, so be, be sure to ask. They're really supposed to be technical experts for incident triage and response. So again, when I get attacked, I want to know that there's someone on the other, other end of the line that can help me contain it eradicate it and get it back up, get me back up and running. Um, they can provide a lot of advanced skill sets. Now, when we get down to some of these advanced skill sets, it's going to be dependent on the personnel specifically that the companies hire. So each one will be a little different, but these are things like understanding MITRE uh, attack framework, tactics and techniques and protocols, understanding how an attacker would look at your environment, do some basic reconnaissance and then attack you. When they know how an attacker would attack you, they can look at it from the other side and say, now, what do I need to put in place to prevent it? Also, what do I need to do to go out and look for some of that behavior to see if potentially you are being attacked? And maybe they're catching it at the at an early stage where the attacker has gained access but hasn't done anything yet because they're still trying to you know, escalate privileges or, or move laterally in your network. So this is a great feature and, and feature set and skill set to have, but it will come at a cost. And then at, a, at the highest level, they're providing that kind of eyes on glass and hands on keyboard so they can upgrade your solutions. They can add exclusions to make products work better. They can reduce false positives so you're not getting just a flood of alerts and triggers. They can configure, they can tune, uh, they can implement policy. So if you have a compliance requirement, you say, I need to do X, Y, Z, can this tool do it? They can come back and say yes and let us implement that for you. They can implement playbooks, automation, et cetera. So there's a lot that they can do. Uh, there's a lot of advantage there. Obviously, it comes at a cost. But what I tell folks is be open to whatever that cost is, because buying the product alone is going to equate to some percentage of that cost. Hiring a single individual to work in your environment uh, at the organization will likely cost more than, than outsourcing this. So again, depending on your organization, you may already have the people. They may already be partially 
employed. And this is just a great thing to add on, but in other cases, it's cheaper just to, to outsource. And last but not least, key takeaways here. Um, these are these are fairly common takeaways that we've talked about in other webinars, but they they ring true here. So I thought they were worth bringing up again. Everything's going to be a risk versus reward, right? This is a security versus business type decision. From a security perspective, you're always going to want as much security as you can afford. From a business perspective, you're always trying to weigh that risk. So you've got to look at these different products. You've got to look at the vendors. You know, when you narrow it down to a set of products and a set of vendors that you want to work with, look at what the differences are, and then really kind of dig into the minutia of, if I pay this much extra, what am I getting? And in most cases, that's really where the business decision comes into, am I happy with the, the base offering that they have, or do I want to spend a little bit extra, and what do I get for that? And a lot of times that's industry-specific, company-specific. So if, like, if you're in healthcare and you have to protect PHI, or you're dealing with um, you know, personnel and, and clients in the EU who have GDPR type uh, requirements, those little niche things are then going to require those product offerings. And for, for you, that means spending the money. Um, cost of layering service on to the products. You know, a lot of people just want to go out and buy the product. And again, to some extent, it will work okay throughout the year. But the minute that you're attacked, that lack of service is going to put you into a bind. And it's, it's typically just too late at that point. Um, you will normally have knowledge gaps because, again, unless you're staffing a large security and IT team, uh, finding those skills and the people with the experience is difficult and expensive. Um, also, resource time. There's a, a lot of times where you have people who have some knowledge. They've taken it upon themselves to get certified. But you have to look at it realistically and say, I have them doing five jobs today. How much time can they really put to this? So even then, with the knowledge, it's, it's not going to make a difference if they're not able to you know, dedicate time. And then last but not least, compliance requirements and insurance. I almost think this should be number one because if there's a requirement, then it's a let's budget for it because we have no choice. And if you're looking at cyber insurance or you already have cyber insurance, how many of these things could we implement to where we will get a break on our uh, both our premium and or deductibles that maybe the reduction in premium offsets the cost of the product and service. And at the end of the day, for the same price, you get better security, uh, without spending an extra dollar. So um, I will leave it at that. If there are any questions, still have about two, three minutes here, uh, if anybody has them, uh, but hopefully this was helpful. And again, um, you know, the main takeaway from most of my webinars, honestly, is to educate you from a, the questions you should be asking, the things you should be thinking about, um, try to keep it as vendor agnostic as possible. Um, but the takeaway again being, look at your environment, see how you are, unique and how the tools need to support you in that unique manner and then develop a set of questions that develop a set of criteria that you need to meet your basic needs uh, maybe even put things in a good better best model and then start researching and talking to vendors and again um, you know you can always reach out to the folks at Intiva and we can help you out and if there are no questions um, I will end here and thank you again for your time have a great rest of your week